We know the creation of our universe and life itself is a mystery. It's wonderful, but it's still a mystery. To explain it, we have two choices. How did it can come to be? One is random chance and natural selection, and the other is an intentional creator oversaw the entirety of both the creation and life itself. The question becomes, what does modern science actually explain, and what can modern science not explain? So what we're going to be looking for are finding the fingerprints of God, our Creator, in the origin of the universe and of life itself. Now, if we're going to find God's fingerprints, we're going to have to know where to look. And we do that at the junction where science knows about things and the Creator's role. Now, the Creator's role is to form our physical space. He has to start our time. He has to create all the laws of nature in order to, for life to exist. So God exists outside our physical world. We live in a physical world. God lives in a spiritual world. Now, the very first step is called the Big Bang, and this is when the universe started. We're going to go into the details of this, but this is when everything was created. So everything came out of nothing. Preceding the Big Bang was nothing. We'll talk about that. That happened a long time ago, 13.8 billion years, but it did have a birthday party. There was a beginning of the Earth, and it was roughly at this time. We know that because it leaves a whole lot of radiation left behind. This is what it looks like. And this can only be there if the universe had a beginning. And then we're going to talk about that, too. So I have another question. Was the Big Bang really loud? It sounds like it. Big Bang. And the next question, weren't we told that the universe, our world, has existed forever? Well, the answer is no. The Big Bang was silent. What happened was there, there was a tremendous explosion of just energy. And most of that energy was light. Like the Bible says, let there be light, and that's exactly what happened. This is called electromagnetic energy, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's a big word, but it's really not very complex at all. And you're going to know all about it when I show you that slide. But what this did, with all this energy left remnants behind which they've discovered in the last few years. And because they can see this remnant that is called cosmic, like in the cosmic space, microwave, just like your microwave at, at your house, background, and it's still there floating around in our universe, all parts of our universe have this. And there's no other evidence of any other microwave from any other universe. So we are a single universe of definite age, 13.8 billion years, and there appears to be no other evidence of any other, we're not a bubble off some other remote universe. And when it starts, the very first thing, that first little explosion is called singularity. It's the single point of origin. So we know the world has not existed forever. It's 13.8 billion years old. Now here's another mystery within the Big Bang. So after the Big Bang started, we showed all the electromagnetic energy coming out. But it starts as a little dot, a little spot, and that's called singularity because it's a single point. But very rapidly, just like a balloon, this blows up to make our entire universe. And our universe is still getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. It's been getting bigger for 13.8 billion years. It's really huge now, but that the universe has a border at some point. It's just hard to ever get there. To get the, it's going out so fast, it's hard to get there at the end. But they know it's expanding. And the scientists know, because it's expanding, that it mathematically has to have a beginning. So the universe is not an infant time. It's not been here forever. So now within that are all these other little the, the matter. These would be all the stars that are collected inside the space. So you have to understand that the space was created and then the stuff within the space was created. Both of them are absolute miracles. Now we said the Big Bang produced electromagnetic energy waves. All right, what does that mean? Well, a, a wave looks like this. And a wave is really, it's just impossible to conceive because it has tons of energy, it flies at the speed of light, and it weighs nothing. It weighs absolutely nothing. It's just a wave in space. We call that electromagnetic radiation or energy. Now, what does that divide into? Well, it divides into radio waves, light waves, microwaves, and gamma rays. Now, how many people have a cell phone? 
If you know that, then the cell phone uses a radio wave to bounce off a satellite to give you a sound. That's how your cell phone works. Now, you can go outside and look or turn on the light. That's light waves. So you know all about light waves. You have your lunch in a microwave. Now you know about microwaves. These are all forms of electromagnetic radiation. You get you hurt your uh, hand and you get an x-ray, and there it comes, and that's just x-rays. And then there's even faster stuff called gamma rays. And these carry energy. So these have very high energy, and these have lower energies. Now, we know they have energy because if you go out in the sun without sunscreen, what happens? You get a sunburn, and the microwave heats your food. So these, even though they're little waves, it's truly a miracle that they even exist, but they do. And this is how energy is supplied to our whole world. Now we're going to talk about the second physical force, and that's gravitational force. And it comes because of the size of the Earth, and it has what we call mass. And the mass creates this force. We don't know what the force is. We just know it exists. They can measure it. They can do all kinds of things. They can, but they don't really know why it happens. This is truly a mystery alert. So God creates this gravitational force, and we use that from the singularity when you have the electromagnetic radiation shooting out. You're going to have little particles. We're going to call them atoms. We'll talk about those in just a minute, and they're going to go sailing out with it, and those little atoms will, out in space will start to coagulate together. They come co what we call coalesce, and they'll turn into first-generation stars. So most of the stars that we see in the sky are just hydrogen gas linked together by gravitational force. And, they, and those stars then meet and form galaxies. Gravitation holds our Earth to the sun and the moon to our Earth. And gravity is what pulls us down to the ground when we jump off a chair. So you know all about gravitational force. Now here's an amazing event. When we said that the with singularity and the Big Bang, we had all this electromagnetic radiation, which we saw, uh, just the waves, it's the radio waves, gamma rays, x-rays, all those kinds of waves when shooting out. Now two of the high energy waves could collide. When they collided, they created little particles called neutrons, protons, and electrons. These are little subatomic particles. And these little particles get pulled together by forces that hold atoms together. So this is the first one is hydrogen atoms. It's just got one of these, one of these, and one of these. And they're held together by these bonds, and we don't know what those bonds are. Only God knows what those bonds are. We can measure them. Science looks at them all the time. We know all about them, but we don't know how they came to be or what they're actually created by. So these create, when these particles, little particles, come together, you make what we call atoms. Now the littlest one is hydrogen. We're going to have to remember that one because that's what most of the stars are made of. It's the way they start. And then you later we're going to have lots of these jammed together, and they're going to make different kind of elements. We're going to show you that in a later slide. Now, as I mentioned before, the laws and the constants of physics all have to be, exist at the very beginning of time. And you look at these, all these different kinds of principles. There's a ton of them. And you look at the, the constants, like the speed of light. You've heard of the speed of light, but it's a huge number. And all these others are constants that have to exist exactly at these levels for the Earth and the universe to even ever come to be. So what we can say is it seems unreasonable to assume that they just randomly appeared. How could this just, at this huge, huge numbers, and they're actually very, very small numbers in most cases, how can they just appear? That's an impossibility. So it's unreasonable to assume they just randomly appeared. The only reasonable conclusion is that they were created, which is only possible if there is a creator with infinite wisdom. Now, we're moving on to the supernova's elementary stardust. So that's the title. We're going to have to know supernova and stardust. Now, the second creation event is absolutely amazing that it even exists. Almost everything we've talked about is amazing, but this is even more amazing. So these first generation stars that came out in space, we talked about in the last slide, they, they can run out of energy. And the energy comes from the hydrogen turning into helium, and that gives off tons and tons of light energy which we so we can see the stars but some of them they run out of energy and when they do they start to collapse and gets the inside this the core of it gets tighter and tighter and the energy gets so high and the heat gets so high that it explodes bam 
Some of them just go into a black hole, but the ones that ex are explode are called supernova. Now, in, because it's so hot and so intense, remember this had hydrogen, helium in it, and that's it. These just little, little atoms in there. And the next thing you know, this fuses them, these hydrogens together, and it makes 94 elements. That's our element table. There's lots of them. You don't have to know their names at all. But you know some of them. We know oxygen. You know gold, silver, aluminum, uranium, all kinds of stuff that gets made. Now, the interesting part is that why did it do this? Because the stars don't care. They don't, they don't care about the 94 elements. But we do because without these elements, our Earth can't exist. So these, these exploding nova happen way before it's necessary to use all this stuff. And in the next slide, we're going to look at the Nifty Nebula. The Nifty Nebula, that's another creation event that's just absolutely remarkable. The, the, these, well, these star formers, these Nifty Nebula, grab the stardust that's blasted out in space, and it's going to pick up all these elements, and it's going to make second generation, a new type of star like our sun, and around the periphery of that sun is going to make the planets like Earth. And this is how at least our nebula, and it may be the only one, our nebula is going to get all of these elements it needs to have life on Earth, in an Earth that functions. Now I just want to, you could ask this question. Hey, we're made of more stuff than just hydrogen gas. Where does everything else come from? And I just answered it a minute ago. All the elements, all these elements we need for life on Earth were made in these giant stars when they collapsed into a supernova with a big explosion. And it took all of the heat that this, this explosion created to make 94 essential elements. And they do that by taking, here's the little hydrogens, and if you have two of them, it's helium. And you mixed all of these together, because in that heat it can. It takes them and jams them together, and it comes down the scale, just making 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all the way up to 94. Now, the interesting part is that the stars don't need the 94 elements. The second generation stars will use some of them up to iron. But the Earth has to have all of them. And that's not going to be necessary until the Earth is created, which is going to happen 9 billion years after the start. <laughs> this is huge time. So this star, the stars are making all the stuff and blasting it out of stardust. The nebula are going to grab it. We'll show you that in just a minute. And it's only for us. So it won't happen until our Earth is created at 4 billion years, and life doesn't happen before a few million years. Now, once you create elements, when the supernova makes the elements, then all those elements can come together, and that's called chemistry, and they join together to make stuff. It makes your clothing. It makes everything that you see around you. It has to be put together by chemistry. And if you look at chemistry, there's lots of laws of chemistry, and there's lots of uh, constants. These are things that have to exist. Then they have to be all these complex numbers have to be available the moment you make the elements. Now, it seems unreasonable, there's 94 elements, it seems totally unreasonable to assume that they just ran, all these numbers just randomly occurred. I mean, that's just impossible. The only reasonable conclusion is that they were created. If they were created, then there has to be a creator. So this is clear evidence, clear evidence, that a, crea a creator was involved at the very start of forming elements and the very start of forming chemistry. Just like the physics was the very start of the physical laws that we discussed earlier. So now we move on to the Nifty Nebula. And this is one of my favorite uh, space warriors right here, N the Nifty Nebula. They took all this exploding stardust coming from the no supernova and they collect it together. And they're going to swirl around like a disk. And in the center, they're going to make second generation stars, just like the sun. And from the stuff on the outside, it's going to make the planets. So how did the Nifty Nebula ever figure out how to grab the stardust, make a second generation star like the sun, and make our planet and the other planets in our little solar system? All for what reason? The reason is you and me and our Earth. Now, we're looking at the Nifty Nebula up close. You can see that it's this structure that has a central hub to it. It looks like a wheel. And inside is going to make a second generation star, which can have some elements like up to iron, which is up to number 26. 
as opposed to all these big giant stars, the first generation, they only have hydrogen and helium in them. And around, so the center gets the sun, like our sun, so our nebula. If we look at our nebula, it has the sun in the middle, and then around the outside in this disk, it's going to make the planets. And it does it because it has to add the 94 essential elements. Without that, we don't run our system. We can't exist. But it does something else very remarkable. It's truly a mystery alert. It puts our Earth exactly at the right distance from the sun so that we don't get too close and burn up or get too far away and freeze. And this is called a habitable, in other words, you inhabit a zone. There's, it, it's just remarkable that, <laughs> that that exists. We're in the habitable zone. Out of all the possible zones you could have, we're at the only one that actually works for life. That is truly a mystery and God's gift to us. Now, in this step, you can't, I, I look at this step and I just start to laugh. I, you couldn't make this story up. But what happened is that when we made the Earth, we got our 94 elements, but we we're a little short of water and carbon. Now, water and carbon makes up 90, 95% of everything, including you and me and the plants. But along the way, and just out of the blue, a meteor arrives, and the meteor is made of ice, which is going to be water, and carbon. And it collides with the Earth. It's one-third the size of the molten Earth because they're both still on fire. It just blends in. So by special delivery, <laughs> only God could make this special delivery, you have this meteor hitting our Earth at about a, mi a billion years after it started, and it brought all the water we needed and all the carbon we needed to have life which wasn't even going to begin for another 9 billion years. It's just utterly astounding. Now, does anybody still think this is just coincidence or good luck? It, it can't be. This could only be orchestrated by an intelligent creator. What a story. Now, then the next step, we call this another miracle alert. There's just one after another, but the Earth, Earth has layers. So when you first form it, it has layers. And the densest stuff, because it's all molten, goes to the bottom. So in the bottom you have a iron core. It's solid as a rock, but it's magnetizable. And when it gets magnetized by the sun, then it has the magnetic field around it, which knocks, keeps the asteroids from constantly bombarding us. Then it happens to put uranium in this deep molten zone that's still on fire. And the, because of uranium, you know, it has fission and it, it creates energy. And that's what heats the earth from the inside. And the sun heats the earth from the outside. And so between the two, you can have life. And you have this mantle, which is just stone. And the top of this mantle has got a squishy layer right here. And the squishy layer is next to the bottom of the Earth's crust. This is the place where we live. There's the mountains, the trees, there's the rivers, and the little bitty lakes. And then we have all this rock underneath us. But it gets down to a layer of the mantle right here that slips. And so what ends up happening, is we, these are called tectonic plates. And originally, all the mass, land mass was all together. And later, it starts pulling apart, and they slide around, and that's what we get our continents today. So it takes a while, but it slides around, and it slides right at that level. Who could think this up except God? Now, if we look at any cliff, you can go any cliff on the side of a mountain, and what you're going to see is the topsoil, which is the thin, t this all there is, is just a little bit of topsoil to grow everything. Under that is the crust, the hard crust is full of rocks, but it comes in layers. Know how it's layered. And that's when they scientists look at, find fossils from the previous past animal experience and uh, plants, they can find them in these layers because they're added one on top of the other. So the oldest rock is on the bottom. And that's how we can tell how old things are looking at fossils. But the Earth's crust is about five to six miles out of the whole Earth, and that's it. Everything else is going to be in the deep part and the core and the mantle. Now here's the Earth's timeline. We're not going to spend any much time on it, but the Earth starts, was created about 4.6 billion years ago. And then it goes along for up to 4 billion years where it gets 4.6 down to 4 billion years. It gets hit by the big asteroid and brings the carbon and water to us. And then it drifts all the way down to 2.5 billion years where you start getting the early forms of life, which are bacteria and these things, little funny things called archaea. And then it drifts along another billion years till you get what's called these eukaryocytes. Now, if you change the word to you or your, this means cell. These are your cells. These are the cells that you have in you, 
and either the cells are in all the plants that we see around us. So that's a big deal. And then finally you get to all of these other eras that go along. We're going to have, we'll show you what those do in a minute, but you're going to get to a dinosaur era and a small mammal area, and then ultimately down to the hominids, which are the monkeys and apes, and finally to us. The big change is what's going to be called the Cambrian, say that again, Cambrian explosion. Cambrian explosion. That's when you move out of the sea and everything moves onto the land and all of the animals and plants start getting much more complex. Now we're going to look at the next four, five, and six steps of their creative events. These are huge changes from the simple animals and the simple creatures. We're going to move on to what we call the U karyocytes, which means your, you take the U and make it your, your cells. They're going to need DNA, which is the instruction manual. Say DNA. DNA is your instruction manual. It's going to take, the plants have to have chloroplasts, which can make oxygen out of carbon dioxide and sunlight, and it can make glucose as well. And that both, this has to happen, this has to happen, and before you can do the mitochondria, can you say mitochondria? These are little energy sources. They're, they're like the batteries in your cell phone. They, if they don't work, then nothing works. We're going to talk about all of these. Now, before we get into the discussion of the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, I'm going to show you something. This is going to be a teaching analogy. It's our living cells versus the cell phone. You all know what a cell phone is. Now, what, uh, what living creatures have to have, both plants and animals, they have to have an outside wall. They have to have an energy source, which has come from the mitochondria. They have to have oxygen, which came from the chloroplasts and the plants. They have to have metabolic systems that make stuff and do stuff. And they have the instruction manual. Now, let's look at the cell, and we look at a, the components of a cell phone. So if you start on the outside, the cell phone case is the same as the cell wall. It has to have holes in it to let the buttons come through and all these kinds of things. And the cell wall has to have buttons and holes in it so that the nutrients can come in and the debris you want to get rid of goes out. So it's not just a simple enclosure, it's complex. Then the cell phone computer is the DNA. So the, the DNA is in there and the DNA is all this long uh, tracks of information. Very complex, it just can't happen by itself. And the computer, the equivalent to the DNA, is in the phone and that's to the computer and that tells the phone how to work and do everything. Now the mitochondria provide the energy. That's equivalent to the battery. There's the battery of the phone, there's the mitochondria making energy. And then you have to have function buttons, okay? So the function buttons are like the chloroplast. They, if you don't have oxygen, so the chloroplast makes the oxygen and it makes glucose and if you don't have those two things, you can't, these have to be present for the mitochondrial to work. So there's a bunch of function buttons which are all present on the cell phone right here. This is how you, you put your apps in there and this is what it's doing. So the, it's, the living cell and the cell phone are really quite similar. Now the, as we follow the Earth's timeline, we get down towards the first living creatures. They are archaea and bacteria, that's their name. Archaea is an organism that still exists in the hydrothermal plants in Finland. It hasn't changed much. The bacteria, of course, have gone, uh, undergone immense uh, change and development. But if you start with preceding it, there's just material floating around. There's nothing organized. There's nothing made. And then all of a sudden, in a very short period of time, you have life. So what has to happen to a single cell? Here you see it has, has to have an outside wall that has channels that are smart, they let good stuff in and bad stuff out. You have to have an energy system. You had to have DNA to run the whole thing. You have to have an instruction manual that's very complex and to make DNA and to have it change to do what you want to do, to, have, you know, to develop more cells, to develop limbs, whatever, it takes an incredible amount of additional creation of DNA and there's no obvious way that that can happen except by a creative event. And finally, they have to reproduce. So all of these things, thing, things do you think can happen randomly, just by accident, in scalding water with toxic chemicals? I think not. This is clearly, a major, creating life is a, as big a deal as the Big Bang. Now, we move along Earth's timeline, down to one of the more important events. 
and that's the formation of eukaryocytes. Now, karyocyte means cells, and you means a good cell, but it also you can translate it as to your, your cells, because this is where we all came from. The other cells were primitive, but right about a billion years, you had these formation of the eukaryocyte cells. This is a huge creative event, as big as the Big Bang, because all of a sudden, you were able to take this simple, comp simple DNA that they had before, it was a single-stranded DNA. Now you could make double-stranded DNA, put it in a nucleus, and develop a mitochondria, which is a little organelle that makes energy. This is your this is the engine for every cell, every cell you have in your body. You have to use this, to, and it has to have it's oxygen-driven, so it has it's an oxygen metabolism, and also it made chloroplasts. Now you realize that both the mitochondria and the nucleus and the chloroplast had to generate all new DNA. These are long chains of, as we've talked about before, long chains of proteins that are able to be used as a template. In other words, it's the instruction manual for everything in the cell to do. So out of the blue, he had to create two new kinds of DNA in the mitochondria and the chloroplast and go from a single strand to a double strand of DNA in the nucleus. These are incredibly complex events. And how it can happen in a toxic soup of the primordial sea is beyond any question. Uh, it's just totally unreasonable if it's random. It has to be a creative event. So once you've done that, now we're going to be able to have one form that will have the nucleus, mitochondria, and the chloroplast, and they're going to become plants. And the others will be the nucleus and the mitochondria. They'll drop the chloroplast. Remember, anything green. Every green leaf, whatever, has the chloroplast. It's not a, it's not complex. If it's green, it's got the chloroplast. And so the others are the, so that we can make plants and we can make animals. And once this happens, at about a billion years, and you get down to 541 million years, all of a sudden you have what was called the Cambrian explosion, where all of a sudden we're going to unfold all of the living creatures on Earth right at that point. Now the fourth creation event is DNA and it comes in the nucleus and a little special organelle called inside a cell that generates all the energy but it has its own DNA, mitochondrial DNA, and then the chloroplast is in mitochondria and nuclei are in plants and animals, but the chloroplast, remember this is green stuff. See it's green. So anything with green, any green leaf has this chloroplast in it. And that's what its DNA looks like. But the DNA is just an instruction manual, but it's written not in words or numbers, but in proteins. So all these little protein links in here have information, and the cell has to translate it here to make any anything it wants, any kind of protein or any anything. It has to read these things out and then make it, which is an absolute mystery how that could happen in a single cell at the beginning, in this primordial soup, this toxic soup that's living in, in the sea, and that just cannot happen in any reasonable way by any random motion, random activity of anything. This has to have the Creator's help. This is all part of the Creator's design, part of the plan. This is what a mitochondria looks like. And the mitochondria is real complex, and what it does is takes all these energy sources, and it strips off these little protons and leaves the electrons inside and the protons accumulate on the outside and then they run through this last little uh, device re number four on the line here one two three and four and it's like a windmill and as they shoot through here and as they do it makes it turns some cells or some chemicals for what we call ADP into ATP ATP you will hear uh, over and over in science uh, that's the energy material that the cell uses and then it puts it all back together with oxygen making water. And it's all directed by the mitochondrial DNA, which comes from your mother. It's the maternal side. Now, if you don't have ATP for two minutes, all your cells quit working, maybe permanently. Now we're going to add in the seventh step, the spark of life. If you don't have the spark of life, none of this matters. And no one understands the spark of life other than our own creator. When we have the spark of life, we're alive. When we lack the spark of life, we're not.
Now here's a challenge. If you go and fill up a pail of uh, with sand and water at the seaside and put it on your front porch, how long do you think it'll take before a frog hops out of there? So the spark of life is important. Nothing runs by itself. You can't just put proteins and chemicals together and have it turn into a plant or an animal. It just is impossible. So the most reasonable explanation is that all living things are formed by a creative hand. They were When they were given life and then were given the ability to live on land or in the water and to adapt to their environment, that's how it becomes all possible. Now this is the timeline. We're not going to spend much time on it. But once you have the eukaryocytes and life begins, then the biggest event happens, what we call the Cambrian era. And it's, it's when the plants and animals start to move on. So first the plants move on and then the uh, animals move on. But it, the, you can see it, from the, it starts at 541 million years. So we've talked about billions of years down to here. Then all of a sudden, at 541 million years, you start getting all these changes. You have the marine plants, the land plants, then the fishes, and then the uh, four-legged animals show up, then the age of insects and trees, and then the seed-bearing plants. Then it continues with the age of the dinosaurs. You remember that, the Triassic period. And that goes along until, bing, there's an extinction and they're all gone. But then it starts from the 145 million years down all the way to the present. So we watch this as it happens. You first get the hominids, which are the monkeys, the apes, and uh, those types of animals, and early man. And finally you get down to the Homo sapiens, which is us. That's us. And we're created and we're also given a soul at about 75,000 years. We start to function like human beings as they exist today. Everything else uh, acts more like animals. When we get the soul, we now have the, we have the ability to self-awareness. We know who we are. And we also aware that we've had a creator, which is the whole point of the talk today. Now we talk about creation in Genesis as seven days of creation. But in fact, if you look at it, although the timeline's a little different, you can see that the seven days of creation really match quite well to what's happened with our creative events. From the Big Bang, through the forming of the stardust, to forming the Earth, developing DNA, chloroplast to make oxygen, mitochondria to have energy, and the spark of life. Day one to day seven, it comes out, and then you add the soul of life at the end of the day. So the scientific view of things, it matches really quite well with the biblical description of the origin of the earth. Now, if we've seen all this, what should our response be? You and me. This girl says, wow, this creation business is really cool. I've got to tell all my friends to look for God's fingerprints. And this guy says, hallelujah. I finally seen the light. It's as if I were blind but could not see. When you see the real events of creation, it all makes sense. Creation and the reality of our Creator are obvious. All I can say now is, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, I've finally seen the light.